our approach at MSK is we do uh, immunohistochemistry for the mismatch repair proteins on all of our colorectal patients. And that is pretty much our dominant issue. We also, as you and everybody else has always done, take a detailed family history. Um, if the family history is not overwhelming and the mismatch repair is proficient, um, usually we stop there. Um, if, you know, th this, uh, I, I have a woman who is, um, she's 34, and while I'm treating her for her mismatch repair proficient um, uh, rectal cancer, her 28-year-old brother gets diagnosed with mismatch repair proficient colon cancer. Um, we're digging into that genome just as deep as we can, trying to figure this out. And of course, we did uh, additional tests looking for um, MSI uh, and NGS, and we haven't found anything. Um, and so uh, from a, a research point of view, we're digging deeper, but um, there, there's nothing there. So it's not our practice and it's not required or recommended within NCCN guidelines to use multiple studies on, multiple, on, on every patient. Now, if you're going to get a next generation sequencing assay, you are going to find out realistically yeah. whether they're mismatch repair de uh, uh, deficient or not. And um, we published um, uh, back in 2015 in JCO, a, a paper I always found a, kind of a, a, a enjoyable because it was so simple I could understand it. Uh, we looked simply at the number of mutations in our NGS report. At the time, our NGS panel was looking at about 265 genes. And it was fascinating. Mismatch repair proficient, the median number of mutations reported was six. Mismatch repair deficient, the median number of mutations reported was 49. The two Venn diagrams did not overlap. And the cut point was 20. There was nobody that was uh, tw over 20 or the 20 or above that was mismatch repair proficient and nobody that was 20 or uh, below that was deficient. The bottom line is, is if I could tell what was going on by counting my fingers and toes. If at the end of counting, I had more digits than the person had more mutations, it was mismatch repair proficient. And if they had more mutations than I had digits, it was mismatch repair deficient. And that turned out to be 100% accurate. And in the three patients where we found it discordant, we dug deeper and the previous analyses were wrong. So um, that brings up the issue of, of um, what you mentioned on the previous patient, which is total mutational burden. Um, it is not relevant in colorectal cancer. Um, uh, uh, Benoit Rousseau and Luis Diaz uh, published this in uh, a, a research letter in the New England Journal in March of 2021. And they showed that basically, if you look at the cut point of 10, uh, it looks like you're getting dramatically more activity to a, a PD-1 in people with over 10 versus under 10 mutation uh, in, in the total mutational burden. But then if you separate out the people that have either mismatch repair deficiency or are pol E mutated, which are ultra mutated and have like 150 mutations as opposed to 50, are, are three times the mutation burden of mismatch repair deficiency. Those people do great. And then everybody else with a TMB between 10 and any number like less than like 35, uh, they do identically to the people with TMB uh, below 10. There's, uh, so there's no, uh, there's no benefit to total mutational burden that creeps over the number 10. Uh, it, it, it's, it's artifactual. There were no uh, colorectal or GI patients on that study that I never understood why got uh, total FDA approval for any mutational burden. It just, the data don't support that. Thank you. And the last thing about bolus 5-FU, I think you've already touched upon that it does add to the, to the, to the regimen in full theory and full fox. Well, yeah, all of the regimens, bolus, uh, uh, full theory, full fox, and everything that's been a permutation of it were designed at a time when uh, the thinking was that there was a different biology of bolus 5-FU versus infusion 5-FU such that you were getting the benefit of two different drugs one that was directly hitting thymidylate synthase and the other that was more interfering uh, with, with uh, direct incorporation into the nucleotides. 
And that probably hasn't panned out. And one of the first things that people designing investigational regimens do when they're having too much toxicity is get rid of the bolus or lower the leucovorin dose or both. Because leucovorin, let's face it, is an affectation left over from the 1980s. All the clinical trials that compared 5-FU to 5-FU leucovorin said the same thing, only they said different things. If it was a study that was the same dose of 5-FU where one arm got leucovorin, the result was more efficacy and more toxicity. But we accepted more toxicity because we said, well, we're not just giving 5-FU. Remember, this is before we had anything else. We were desperate to say we had something. Whereas studies that were done with 5-FU leucovorin versus a higher but equitoxic level of 5-FU only show the same level of toxicity and the same level of activity. So when there are leucovorin shortages, I yawn. It, it's not something that keeps me up at night. And it really is sort of a silly affectation. It kind of rolls off the tongue. 5-FU uh, and leucovorin just sort of naturally follows. Um, but uh, I, I don't think there's much to it. So bringing down the leucovorin dose, getting rid of the bolus are my first uh, uh, adjustments when I have toxicity. Um, we use it because it's there. If we started with a blank slate, we'd probably be doing infusional 5-FU. We may, we, we'd probably make life simple and not bother with leucovorin, and we probably wouldn't use bolus. So if you don't use bolus, I think Dr. Viraj is asking, would you omit leucovorin? Well, leucovorin modulates 5-FU. And so when you take out leucovorin, you are decreasing the intensity of your infusion as well. Oh. Um, and so if I don't need to, I, I, I don't get rid of it. Yeah, the other thing I would mention, the original Roswell Park studies were giving 5-FU as a bolus in the middle of uh, a two-hour infusion of leucovorin. And that's where the two hours comes in in the full Fox and full Fury because that was the standard at the time. Mm. And I searched the world for any rationale for that. I went to the sources, uh, to Bertino and, and to all the people that were at Mockover, the people that were involved in, in developing his regiments. There was no science to it. It was a couple of guys sitting around over a beer in the evening deciding what to do and saying, I don't know, give it before, give it after. What the heck? Let's give it over two hours and give the score to 5-FU in the middle. And that's how science went forward. So we have a tendency to think that once we're doing something, that it's grounded in really fundamental, elegant, uh, basic science. And all too often, it's a bunch of smart, motivated people getting together and making a reasonable decision. And then once we do it, we tend to put it on a pedestal and think it is somehow scientifically anointed. Yes. Absolutely. So for instance, when we give um, full Fox and full Fury at MSK, we give all our leucovorin basically as brief infusions. Um, we give all our aridotecan over 30 minutes. And we give our oxaliplatin at a rate of one milligram per meter squared per minute. So our 85 milligram per meter squared doses are given over 85 minutes. If we reduce it down to uh, 65 milligrams, we give it over 65 minutes. We published that uh, schedule. It's in uh, it's it's quoted in NCN guidelines. It saves a tremendous amount of chair time and uh, yeah. makes things a lot easier on the patients. I think that's very very helpful. Doctor Das wants to know if uh, if MSI high patient should we consider neoadjuvant immunotherapy in all patients based on the data? So it's very interesting. Um, right now, that's not standard. Um, what we're publishing is the results of a clinical trial that far 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 exceeds any of our expectations. Nobody could have gone in expecting that we were going to have 100% complete clinical response. I mean, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, figuring out the science of what is making that happen is going to be a real interesting challenge, and it's going to be really important. Um, would I, once, these pay, once this stuff is published, um, I think very quickly, I, I plan to bring it to the NCCN panel. Um, uh, at the latest, it will be when we meet in August, but often what we do is we set up a, a, uh, a Zoom type meeting uh, in the few weeks after ASCO to see if there's anything that we should regard as practice changing. Once it's in the guidelines, at least in this country, insurance would pay for it. Um, that's going to be an issue uh, out, uh, you know, until that is established. But uh, right now, um, it's not what we're doing for all colon cancer, 
because again, you can resect the colon cancer very efficiently. Um, I think that's gonna change. Our protocol, Dr. Sersek's protocol has now expanded um, so that you can uh, put colon patients on. And so we'll have some data on that. Right now, what we have is good anecdotes. So outside of a clinical trial, we're not routinely doing it, but I think more and more it's going to become a standard. Thank you, Len. That's uh, brilliant, actually, going back to basics for 5-FU, MSI testing, infusional 5-FU.